thanks again for inviting me, Jill, and uh, thanks for being patient with me during <laughs> this epidemic. Jill wanted me to speak uh, a couple of months ago, but she was kind enough to let me delay this uh, for a little while. Um, I was initially going to talk about, um, do a Croy review, and I actually started that talk, but um, COVID hit, and uh, I've been busy with dealing with the COVID stuff. And as I sat down to kind of put together the Croy review talk, um, I thought that um, this might actually be a little bit more interesting. <laughs> um, some of this is probably what we've all been hearing over and over again, but I decided to try to put it together into one place to um, maybe have it all make a little bit more sense. Um, so um, I'm sure most of you know me. Um, I'm in the Division of Infectious Disease, uh, and I um, uh, mostly work on molecular epidemiology um, of HIV, uh, and uh, also do some projects related to HIV and aging, um, but this is clearly uh, unrelated to any of that. Um, so uh, if you hear any noises in the background, the dog or kids, it's our, it's our neighbor's kids. It's not ours, because ours are way too well behaved to come into the room while I'm giving a talk. Um, and with that, I will get started. Um, I'm just going to minimize this. So the, <clears throat> the title of my talk today is Modeling the Epidemic, Making Sense of the Chaos. And, you know, as what I like to do with talks, um, please um, ask questions during the talk. I'm more than happy to answer them along the way. Keep it more informal. You know, send your questions to Jill by the chat box and, uh, and, um, and be happy to stop and um, answer them as we go along. Because some of this is a little convoluted and complicated. Oops, uh -oh. how do I move forward? All right, so epidemic modeling. I'm not probably the right person to be talking about this. I know that Natasha, I didn't realize this, but Natasha Martin is gonna be giving a talk in a couple of weeks um, and she's really our star epidemic modeler. Um, so maybe I'll use this talk to set the stage and, and uh, for uh, Natasha's talk in a couple of weeks. Um, but models can provide an important and Models provide important and useful information. They help us understand the roots of an epidemic. They can provide insights into the current situation. They can identify whether measures to control the outbreak have a measurable effect. They can inform predictions about the potential future growth of an epidemic, estimate risks to other locations, other countries, and potentially even guide the design of alternative interventions. So uh, as <clears throat> we all know at this point, so the origin, origins of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak uh, were almost certainly in, in the um, Hubei province in China, in the city. You know, the major uh, epidemic at this point looks like it's emanated from the city of Wuhan. Um, and trying to kind of make sense of how we got to that point, right? So we used uh, file genetic data to really kind of help us hone in on where this came from and how this started. And I think this is important because we need to know how this epidemic started so we can both prevent the next one and prevent any future seeding of the current epidemic. And so back in February, which is very early on, um, this came out in the Lancet and, and obviously it was actually uh, released earlier on, uh, on preprint servers as well. Um, but they took the sequence of um, several SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, viruses sampled from individuals in Wuhan, and they compared it to uh, known phylogenetic or known sequences from a number of other coronaviruses, including SARS and including MERS. Uh, and when you put the tree together, they found that clearly the, the new coronavirus formed its own clade. Um, so it was very uh, unique and distinct from uh, many of the other coronaviruses, particularly so from SARS, uh, the original SARS, as well as uh, MERS. Um, and what they found that the, the virus was most closely related to uh, several bat coronaviruses uh, isolated in, um, in another province in China and, and 
uh, one that was uh, isolated in Kenya. And then and around nearly the same time, another paper that was also on the preprint server for a while and was published in, in Nature finally in February. Uh, this is a, a paper that came out primarily from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, which is um, obviously at the center of the epidemic, and it, which is an institute that studies coronaviruses. And when they went back, they, they actually had another sequence of a uh, bat coronavirus that was um, sampled um, in Yunnan province. And this was the RATG13 virus. And this turned out to be extremely uh, similar to the, uh, ser the viruses that were um, being collected in Wuhan at the time. And as you can see, the sample viruses, at least on this tree, you know, they were nearly identical, all the ones from Wuhan. And that's why that is basically a straight line. There's no branch length coming off of them. There's no, uh, there was very minimal, if any, evolution uh, of those sample viruses in Wuhan at the, at the initial stages of the ep epidemic. And so this, this rat bat virus um, was 96.2% similar between uh, there was a 96.2% uh, similarity between this bat coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so that's quite striking, uh, suggesting uh, a close proximal um, relationship. Um, and when they did sort of a, um, uh, a scan of the uh, genome, they found that, so the, this, uh, this is, I'm looking at, um, sorry, figures, C uh, on the bottom left. Uh, so 100% similar would be the SARS-CoV virus on top. And that blue line represents that RATG13, which as you can see is very close to 100% similar across almost the entire genome. But there's a little dip um, and that little dip area is probably corresponding, uh, uh, corresponds to the spike protein, which is a protein uh, that is oftentimes unique to each of the, more unique to each of the coronaviruses. And if you look um, at the other color, so particularly, uh, um, you know, these are just other bat coronaviruses on here, so, but you can see that there's some, some variation between different bat coronaviruses and that are also closely related uh, and SARS-CoV-2. So then what about the pangolin? I'm sure all of you heard the, um, reports that maybe this was related to a pangolin or what was the intermediate host? So did this virus come directly from bats into humans or was, was there an intermediate animal host? Um, and so the story here is really interesting, I think. Um, so in October of 2019, uh, so again, this is before the presumed initiation of, of the current epidemic, uh, two Malay uh, pangolins, pangolins, I can't even say that right, uh, died of pulmonary disease. Uh, um, a frothy liquid was noted in their lungs and the lungs were fibrotic. Uh, and eventually a, a coronavirus was isolated from, uh, from, those, from that lung tissue. So um, when, <clears throat> when those coronaviruses were uh, sequenced and placed on the same tree as SARS-CoV-2 uh, or, or the other coronaviruses, they were also very closely related to the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that was seen in Wuhan, but not quite as closely related as, uh, as um, the RATG13 virus. So it was, there was about a 91% homology between the pangolin coronavirus and, and SARS-CoV-2, as opposed to the 96% uh, uh, for the uh, RATG13. So closely related, but seemingly less likely to be the direct source of transmission uh, into the human population. Um, that particular pangolin virus, but there may have been others. So then um, kind of delving into this a little bit further, uh, Christian Anderson and his group just over at Scripps um, uh, released this paper, um, which was um, a really detailed look at the these sequences and uh, between the SARS-CoV-2, RATG13, pangolin, and some other uh, bat coronaviruses. And what they noticed was that the um, there were sort of uh, two interesting two interesting areas in, in the spike protein, uh, and one was that the receptor binding domain. And at the receptor binding domain, 
if you look, which is, again, this is um, one of the most specific areas for the virus, uh, or unique areas for the virus, the pangolin virus was actually more closely related to SARS-CoV-2 than the, than the bat, um, RATG13, particularly at these uh, six binding residues um, that you can see at the bottom of the figure. Um, so those are the ones that are boxed here. Um, and if you can see that uh, on the top is SARS-CoV-2, um, those six uh, residues are outlined uh, in boxes. And then you can see for the RATG13, none of those six amino acid residues match SARS-CoV-2, while for the pangolin virus, all six of them match, uh, suggesting that, you know, the there may be uh, a little bit more to this story than we realize. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing they noticed was that the SARS-CoV-2 um, had a new area, um, a new sort of insertion site, which was uh, four amino acids um, that turned out to be what's called a polyba polybasic cleavage site. And this polybasic cleavage site has been shown in other viruses uh, and to also uh, enhance pathogenicity. And then how this works is this polybasic cleavage site allows the human proteases, um, furin, for example, uh, many of the human proteases to cleave this um, site, which allows this uh, spike protein to functional Functional better, function better uh, as, as both there's a binding unit and a fusion unit and when it's cleaved, it, it functions uh, much better or is necessary to function. Um, so this was added. So again, this is different than both the RATG13 and the uh, pangolin bar. So this is also fairly different. So what's going on there? So this polybasic cleavage site, a little later, um, the group from uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology found another coronavirus that wasn't necessarily that closely related to SARS-CoV-2, it was reasonably closely related, but, but that particular virus did have a very similar uh, amino acid motif at that, kind of matching that nearly that polybasic cleavage site. So the amino acids didn't match exactly, but it did demonstrate that their coronavirus could have insertions in this region, which is really the, the region between the S1 and the S2 unit subunits of the, of the spike protein. Um, so again, providing a little bit more history that, um, or a little bit more evidence that this all could happen in nature. And why I'm getting to that is I'm actually gonna go back a slide. So now, um, one of the things that's been thrown around <laughs> in the lay press and by our government is that, that maybe this virus was a uh, lab strain that was released into the environment or potentially even a um, modified uh, virus that was released into uh, the population. Uh, when you look carefully, at least at these viruses, right? So um, that polybasic cleavage site is, is fairly unique to the ones that are, bit, are known. Uh, and then even in the um, pangolin virus, or even the more closely related RATG13, there are numerous amino acids, particularly in this binding area, this receptor binding domain, that are quite different between SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and really, you know, if someone were to go in and just manipulate the virus and add this polybasic cleavage site and add this binding motif, um, you wouldn't make you wouldn't make changes up and down the. Uh, the sequence on either side, it would just be at that site, which is, you know, mostly how our molecular biology tools work. So this suggests that this was a more uh, of an evolutionary derived process. So uh, it's pretty clear to all of us, I think, that this was not a, or highly unlikely to be a, a, um, a bad actor uh, doing this, but just to drive that point home. Um, and then uh, in that same paper, um, the group from Wuhan showed that uh, coronaviruses can recombine. Um, and that's also also, really important, also very important, because that tells us that you could have multiple viruses uh, infecting potentially, you know, potentially a bat um, who, who can have more than one virus or maybe even an intermediate host. 
um, where re recombination occurs, and then, then you can start to see where the polybasic site may have moved into the RATG13 virus uh, or something along those lines. Uh, so here are um, four phylogenetic trees in which they sequence the full virus in, in, on the top left, A. So this is a tree of the full virus. In B is just the spike protein, or the gene for the spike protein. C is at, uh, a subset of that spike protein, which is the receptor binding domain, and then um, D is the RNA polymerase. And that we talked about how that um, uh, RATG13 is probably the, the most closely related virus. So in the top left A, uh, it is the most closely related virus, although the um, RMYNO2 is stuck in between there. It has a longer branch length, which means it's less closely related. Um, but um, if you look down, what am I trying to say? Then, yeah, if you look at uh, C, for example, the receptor binding domain, you can find some other viruses like the pangolin viruses that are actually more closely related to the, to the um, um, Wuhan virus. And then in particular, if you look at that RMYNO2 in the full sequence, again, reasonably closely related to the sars corona uh, CoV-2. And then if you look at the receptor binding domain, you can see that it's quite far away, suggesting that the segment uh, of the receptor binding domain um, was very, is very different in that particular virus, even though the rest of the virus is very similar. Again, all these, these are uh, points that suggest a uh, differences or potential recombination where you have very close homogeneity in one area and one part of the genome such as the uh, RNA polymerase for that RNYNO2, and yet uh, a very distant relationship for another part of the domain uh, of the virus, like in the receptor binding domain. Okay, so that leads us to kind of where, where did SARS-CoV come from? And so there are sort of three uh, potential um, phylogenetic relationships. One is that the pangolin had it first and passed it to the bat and us humans, and it evolved a little bit differently there. The other option is that uh, it started in the uh, bat and was passed to the pangolin and to us, and maybe there was an intermediate host somewhere in there that had some of those, that had that um, uh, matching, those matching mutations in the receptor binding domain. Uh, and third, probably uh, a little less likely um, is, that it came from us and it went to the um, bat and the pangolin. Okay, so taking the sequence data a little further, you know, we talked about now, you know, we have a sense of that, it, you know, the um, zoonotic uh, origins of the virus, but uh, where did it come from geographically? And, and I think we all have a, a reasonable sense of this, but I think uh, the next strain team has done an incredible job collecting sequences and sort of showing this phylogenetically as well. Um, so these are, as of, uh, I think this was, uh, the last time I did this was like May uh, 8th. Uh, there was 4,645 uh, sequences. Uh, actually, this was sort of through April. Um, that they've been collecting from around the world. So these are all sequences that are deposited in, into a, a sequence database. And they've been building a tree iteratively with, with these additional sequences. And here those sequences are labeled by a uh, country of origin. Um, the right has the key, although I didn't get the whole key on there, I apologize, but um, USA is in red. And you can see that there's two major clades uh, in the US, but there's uh, U.S. sequences really sporadically populating the entire uh, breadth of the tree. Um, in purple is China, where the original sequences uh, um, were initially sampled. But for the U.S., you can see that clearly there's at least two big clades of viruses. Um, and at least in this tree, most of the Washington sequences uh, fall on the clade that's uh, towards the bottom of the, of the tree and the, most of the New York sequences are up at the top of the tree, but there is some mixing uh, as people did move around the country. Um, anyways, this, in addition to uh, 
looking at these phylogenetic relationships, next train allows us to uh, infer the time course of the, of the phylogenetic tree uh, somewhat as well. Now, um, it's, the virus itself is a, uh, it's not a fast evolving virus. Um, and so there isn't a whole lot of evolutionary signal in the viral sequence data, but the data that, that we do have and from what we've, and from these analyses that um, groups have done, they um, essentially estimate the origin of the epidemic right around the same time, towards the end of November, the beginning of December in, in, uh, in Wuhan, China. So when we had some additional data that is that is that correct? And I think that's one of the other questions that's being debated, uh, in, at least in the lay press. So again, the early report suggested that the first cases occurred at the end of November, early December. However, there is now evidence of a case from a man in France who presented to care on December 27th, and he was a community acquired case. So he was therefore likely infected between December 14th and 22nd. Um, and it means that, that somebody else had been infected prior to him because it was a community spread case uh, that passed the virus to him. So um, unless someone um, from the original outbreak ha had brought the virus right to, to France, this does suggest that maybe um, the outbreak started a little earlier. Uh, and similarly in the US, so this is a little later, uh, the first no deaths in the US occurred secondary to coronavirus occurred in Santa Clara County, February 6th and February 17th. And these were also from two individuals that had no uh, travel history uh, and no known contact, or, well, I should say no travel history. So uh, they acquired the virus, uh, again, also from the community, suggesting uh, there was already community spread in Santa Clara County by um, late January. Um, so kind of getting to that point of the evolutionary signal. Um, so this is a map of all the mutations, uh, or sorry, a map uh, or a figure depicting the time of sampling from the, and the number of mutations in the virus from the um, original strains. And you can see that the, the bulk of the viruses so far have less than, way less than 20 uh, mutations, more, more on the order of 10 mutations or less uh, from the uh, originating uh, viruses. And that's quite small. Um, you know, this is over the course of several months uh, and in a 30,000 uh, or 30 KB-ish genome. Uh, so it's a fairly slow, slow evolving virus. And the, part of the reason for that is uh, respiratory viruses, um, because they're getting transmitted from person to person, um, the evolution is potentially a little slower uh, because um, the evolution may be occurring in one of us who gets infected, uh, but we've transmitted before really much of the uh, evolution has occurred. Uh, and the second reason is the virus itself also has a uh, exonucleus on its um, uh, polymerase, which is the enzyme that copies itself. And the exonucleus kind of provides some proof proofreading for the virus. Um, so taking all this into uh, account and the clock rate actually if you check next strain today the clock rate has gone down to like 23 mutations per year so this is a continually evolving number um, so again our inferred origin uh, origination of this epidemic is roughly around december 3rd but again there's a huge amount of uncertainty in this estimate um, and there's sort of two two big um caveats to that uh um estimate. And one is that if there were multiple introductions at the same time, then potentially the epidemic even started later than that. So what if, if it truly was at the market and 15 or 20 people got infected that first day from some animal that was spewing virus, the epidemic would and potentially could take off much faster than that. Uh, and that would sort of readjust the date a little bit uh, forward. So maybe the first week of December or second week of December. Um, if it was, and then secondly, there are lineages that may have died out. So there may have been people that had got infected um, earlier on in the epidemic that did it, maybe they died before they could pass it on, or maybe their, um, those particular viruses didn't get sampled and the, eventually the, the chain of transmission died out. And so we're not seeing that in, in our um, current 
um, history, evolutionary history or sampling history. Um, and that might suggest that the epidemic started um, earlier. So again, it's a non-certain estimate, but I think it's a, it still remains a reasonable estimate that the end of November, early December is probably around the time this really took off. And, and the epidemic that we're seeing right now is, is really from that, um, that uh, strain at least. So I, I'm gonna skip this here, but if, I encourage everyone to check out nextstrain.com and they, they have some, uh, a beautiful video showing how the epidemic is spread from, uh, from China outwards. Um, and also there's a lot of tools where you can play with the sequences to kind of look at uh, different uh, aspects of, of the metadata associated with those sequences to kind of look at spread. So then recently there was another, um, question that was posed into or put out um, and that was about uh, are there really bad strains of this virus um, and there was a um, there's been two papers both by the same group and the second one just came out a, a week ago or so on a preprint server and this is from the group over at Los Alamos and what they noticed was that there was a emerging mutation in the spike protein that appears to be sort of taking over the uh, taking over in, in the SARS-CoV virus um, phylogeny. This was this D614G mutation. And they argued that um, because it's sort of taking over uh, in the phylogeny, and they did some additional analyses to show this, uh, that it may be more transmissible. Um, and then if it's more transmissible, then maybe it's improving receptor binding. Um, and then because of its location, it may also impact fusion activation and potentially even impact the uh, uh, antibody dependent enhancement um, effects because um, it's actually an uh, immune epitope, this particular mutation. Uh, when they actually looked at the cases, they didn't see any signals for virulence, but they said that the, the CT values, which are sort of a, a, a quantitative estimate of the virus, were lower with the, um, uh, with the G clade, which is the mutation clade as opposed to the D-clade, which, which corresponds to a higher viral load. Now, other people have looked at this mutation uh, as well and kind of reanalyzed the data and, and um, think that you know, this could all be explained just by what's called the founder effect, that this particular virus is the one, the, the G strain is the one that ended up in Europe and it just took off in Italy and, and went from there. And it was just mainly because of that fact that it's, um, growing more common at this point. So uh, I think the story is still uh, not clear uh, and uh, but evolving. Okay, um, so what was predicted, predicted to happen in the epidemic based on previous epidemic models? So I'm gonna go back in history a little bit. So this is a paper published in 2003 with the SARS epidemic um, and it was specific to Hong Kong and they modeled the epidemic at that time um, and using a deterministic model. And they found that um, uh, at that time, if there were no control measures or change in behavior, uh, that the clearly the epidemic would have continued to exponentially change and grow. Um, and if uh, there was no change in behavior, but um, they were able to get the hospitals time from onset to hospitalization down to two days, it would may, make only a minor effect. Um, but then these are some of the uh, measures that Hong Kong instituted. If a complete cessation of movement between districts, uh, trying to reduce population contact, and also in, reduce the risk of in-hospital transmission. And by putting all those together, uh, they were able to uh, obviously um, stem the SARS epidemic. And the model shows that these, these efforts really made a big difference. And then similarly, kind of looking at international spread of a virus, this is a, a model of the international spread of a, of a potential pandemic influenza. And they looked at the impacts of travel reduction and uh, transmission reduction uh, in a model where you had 105 cities and they used at the time contemporary transport uh, parameters. So uh, connections between flights and, and uh, other transportation links. Um, and they, the idea was to see what, how many, how many of these major cities would sustain a major outbreak um, if these introductions were put in place 
you know, at different times. And so, um, so kind of going down, A and B represent one case per 10,000. Uh, C and D represents 100 cases per 10,000. E, e and um, uh, F represent 1,000 cases. Uh, I'm trying to remember if maybe it's per 100,000 per day. And G and H represent 10,000 cases. I think 10,000 cases total, sorry. And the, the interventions occur um, in the originating state. And so this was all modeled based on Hong Kong being the originating city. Uh, and they vary the timing of the intervention. And essentially what the point of this slide really is to show that, you know, travel reduction works if you do it early, as that's a no brainer. And it worked really in the, when there were low levels of cases in the originating city. Um, but by the time you got to, uh, you know, 100 cases per 10,000 in, in the, in the um, uh, originating city, it was essentially useless. Uh, and transmission reduction also works really, really well um, in if, it, if you have an impactful uh, way of uh, reducing transmission. So it has, you have to have an impact of at least 40%. Um, and that works again early in the epidemic, but by the time you get later in the epidemic, uh, you essentially uh, lo lose any impact on uh, transmission around the world. And essentially, you know, when by the time Wuhan uh, shut down travel on January 23rd, uh, there was estimated 18,000 cases. So it had already sort of crossed that 10,000 case threshold. So then people have started uh, modeling the epidemic um, to kind of get a sense of really how bad the epidemic was in China. Um, and we'll talk about how we got to that 18,000 uh, number. So this is a model that came out of the London School of Tropical Medicine. Um, so by Kucharski et al. And they, they used a bunch of data sets and they kind of put them all together. So they used data sets from new internationally exported cases, new cases in Wuhan, that were reported, daily number of new cases in China that were reported, um, the proportion of infected passengers on inf and evacuation flights, and then new exported cases from Wuhan. So these are cases that were in um, other countries uh, that from individuals that came from Wuhan, and data on uh, new confirmed cases in Wuhan um, sort of after this measurement, measurement period all the way to February 11th. And the assumptions they made is they, they, they assumed that the outbreak started within a single infectious case on November 22nd, and they assumed an incubation period of five days, a mean, excuse me, a mean of five days with a, uh, a standard deviation of 3.7 days, and a delay from onset to isolation of um, two to three days, or three days roughly. And then they added a bunch of deferential equations. Um, these are deferential equations being very kind to each other. And they calculated the time varying reproductive number. So the reproductive number as we all know is the sort of how, how many individuals does an infected individual infect. And that number is, can vary uh, with time and, and impacts of interventions, impacts of um, susceptible population, et cetera. And so they calculated a time varying reproductive number for Wuhan based on this data. So they, they put all these data together um, and they did a number of analyses to kind of uh, look at uh, how accurate their numbers were uh, with, um, sorry, how accurate their predictions were with what was actually observed. So they actually used two data sets to kind of um, validate their, their model. And in both of those data sets, things were reasonable. And they came up with this time varying reproductive number that showed that, you know, the R naught was roughly, or RT, I should say, varied from about two to two and a half or so for mu much of the early part of the epidemic. And then with the institution of the um, travel restrictions, uh, then um, the R naught actually dropped below one. And as you see that peak coming up on the far right, that represents infections now in other countries. So as the epidemic spread uh, out of China. Um, and the, the um, bottom two uh, parts of the figure that I put on the slide, uh, on the bottom 
left is the uh, what the number of new cases they predicted based on this data uh, in Wuhan, and then they compare that to what was observed. So, when observed are the um, open circles and the and the new cases that were predicted are is in the in the graph with the uh, confidence interval, and you can see essentially that um, it is. Uh, more than tenfold uh, bigger. So the uh, predicted number is uh, the y-axis on the left and the uh, confirmed number is the y-axis on the right. Um, and so there was a, as you might expect, you know, uh, the, they were not uh, diagnosing all the cases. And so this is what uh, the model suggests as the actual true number of cases. Uh, and then just the, the, the figure on the right, uh, on the bottom is just uh, how they, their observations for exported cases, or sorry, their predictions for exported cases matched with the observations, and they actually matched reasonably well uh, in their model, showing the open circles are the actually observed cases that were exported, and, and the uh, uh, the um, shaded area represents the predicted. And you can see that um, those match pretty well, depending on the date. So in conclusion, they, they said that uh, the r naught ranged from around 2.35 initially in Wuhan, which is similar to other estimates. Travel restrictions really seemed to make an effect to decrease the r naught in China. The estimated caseload was at least 10 times more than the number reported in Wuhan. And they did some sensitivity analyses uh, to kind of look at the impact of multiple introductions, but they, they think the dynamics suggest either a single infection that defied the odds, you know, got lucky and started spreading, um, or maybe there were multiple introductions, but probably roughly around the same time. They did notice that there was more than expected introductions in the US, France, and Australia. And I think that's important to note because obviously we had uh, evidence of community transmission earlier than we thought here in the US, probably in, in mid to late January. Uh, and similarly in, in France, uh, as, as noted by that, uh, that one patient who was uh, probably acquired the infection in mid-December. So then, more recently, the group at Los Alamos, another group at Los Alamos, kind of took uh, another set of data and tried to re-estimate the r naught. And the reason they did this is they felt like the data uh, that was coming from Ube province was probably um, not uh, as accurate as it uh, as it could be because they were in the midst of an epidemic they weren't able to diagnose everyone and so they thought maybe if we use data that was probably more likely to be accurate um, we might get a better estimate of the r naught and so what they did is they took it they took into account the reported cases in provinces outside ube so these are cases that were exported from ube province um, and the reason they felt that way is that those provinces had time to get themselves ready for the uh, onslaught of the epidemic. So they were doing active case finding as opposed to passive case finding. They were screening at the rail stations, et cetera. So the numbers will be much, much more accurate in these outside provinces. Um, and then they um, also looked at persons from Wuhan that were diagnosed outside of the Ube province. These are, again, travelers that came from Wuhan to kind of estimate how many people went out of Wuhan and um, what proportion of those were infected. And when they put that data together, um, they um, came up with a R naught that was closer to 5.7. Now this R naught is dependent upon the, uh, what's known as the serial interval, which is the um, time between one person having symptoms and the person they infect having symptoms. So uh, in this model, they, set several, they looked at a, a number of different serial intervals ranging from, uh, you know, six days to nine days, and they ran the simulations multiple times with varying these uh, serial, interval, serial intervals. Um, and that does actually impact the R-naught. So a shorter serial inter interval means uh, that the, the doubling time is shorter, uh, and so the R-naught is actually uh, going to go down a little bit. But uh, and the assumption that the R naught was around seven to eight days, uh, we were they were coming up with, or sorry, six days, uh, they were coming up with an R naught of roughly around 5.7. I think it should be seven days. 
Um, and uh, the, the plot on the right just represents the probability distribution uh, of R0, so probably don't need to go into that. Now, one of the important things is that since that study, a number of other studies have um, uh, estimated the serial interval, and um, people think that the serial interval, serial interval uh, after that initial outbreak, when people weren't sure what was going on and people were presenting to the hospital a little later uh, and weren't necessarily quarantining themselves, uh, once um, the epidemic was understood and was people were aware of it, the serial interval actually uh, went down, and that suggests you know that um, uh, that maybe the R naught is quite not quite uh, not quite as high as was suggested in this model. However, that's true in China. Then things changed again in the in the U.S. and Italy, etc. So. Um, I think a re six to seven days probably remains at least a reasonable estimate. Um, so again, the summary from this paper was there was a higher undiagnosed caseload in Wuhan, uh, greater than 10 times. The R0 was greater than five. And using their data, they said, said they um, estimated that the lockdown occurred uh, after an estimated 18,700 cases in Wuhan, which was essentially too late to stop spread around the world based on the previous pandemic model for flu. And so that the epidemic we see essentially is not unexpected since what was occurring in, in January. Okay, so that's what happened. So what can we do? What can models tell us to help us um, figure out what to do? So one major question is, uh, what is, is, is the summertime gonna help us? <laughs> and so R0 is not a biological constant, so it depends on social structure, the density of habitation, behavior, and environmental and climate conditions. And so looking at the impact of season on the epidemic, uh, Richard Nair and his group um, looked at data from Sweden where they have extensive data on other coronaviruses. Um, and they looked at the seasonal patterns of, of de detection of those other coronaviruses. So these are the other human coronaviruses. And there was a clear seasonal pattern uh, to those coronaviruses. Um, so on the left is an annual, uh, fraction positivity, fraction of tests that were positive. Uh, and then on the right is um, sort of uh, compressed into one year. And you can see really that most of these coronaviruses tend to peak, you know, around uh, November, December, January, and they start heading down. But there's, there are slightly different peaks for the slightly different coronaviruses. As, as for example, um, uh, 229E has a peak that's closer to March as opposed to, you know, the other uh, HKU1 uh, has a cl peak closer to December. Um, and there was a, a big difference between winter and summer. Um, and so they use this data to sort of model how that might impact uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and they looked at how, depending on when the peak would be for this particular virus, how that might impact the next wave of infection. And if you look at that left graph here in, in this model, the, um, they looked at uh, November, January, March as potential peaks for the virus. And if, if the true peak of the virus, the seasonal peak of the virus was in November, um, then we would probably expect a, a, an equal, if not higher peak uh, in the coming November. Um, and then he suggested if in January, again, there may be an equal peak, um, but maybe we'll have, uh, um, sorry, it, it would probably be another equal peak, but maybe a little bit delayed uh, uh, next January. However, if the peak of the, uh, the seasonal peak of the epidemic is in March, which sort of is matching uh, sort of the worldwide spread of the virus, uh, if that's truly the seasonal peak as well, we might be lucky and have a much lower peak um, in the following year. So what about the impact of crowding? Um, maybe I'll actually, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this one. Well, real quickly, so the impact of crowding. So as you might expect, uh, crowding should impact the R0. Uh, um, and, um, Maybe this may be one of the reasons why the densely populated regions like New York City and some of the other urban areas are, are seeing a higher uh, impact of the virus. Um, but strangely enough, um, the 
intensity of the epidemic, so the, the peak of the virus uh, in these models um, uh, did not seem to correlate with crowding, but actually the, the uh, I'm trying the spread, the, the duration of the epidemic seemed to be a lot longer in crowded areas. So uh, a peak, the peaks were very, very similar uh, when modeled out in, in a dense urban area or a sparse area uh, in terms of the fraction of people infected. Obviously, in a, in a large city, there's a lar larger number of people, so there'll be a larger uh, proportion infected. But in a large crowded area, uh, like an urban uh, environment, uh, that it's going to be very hard for that epidemic to die off. Uh, just because there is a, uh, a large, uh, larger susceptible population and the, the continuing uh, social interactions uh, um, that are part of daily life or are more common. Okay, so what about the travel ban? So this is looking back at China. So uh, here, uh, Chan and colleagues looked at the impact of the Wuhan travel, the virus in China. So this was on the top graph, you can see the uh, numbers of travelers, travelers recorded from Wuhan in 2017, 2018, uh, around the time of the Spring Festival. And then in blue, so that's red and orange, and in blue, you can see that uh, the travel ban was issued in 2020, and there was a dramatic decrease uh, in, you know, over the course of two days from the initiation of the travel ban. Travel limits essentially went to zero. Um, and, Oops. So essentially, they looked at provinces outside of Hubei uh, across China, and they looked at the cumulative number of cases uh, by January 30th in those provinces, and they correlated with that with travel movements uh, from Wuhan to each city before the Spring Festival, so sort of before that uh, travel ban took place. And it essentially was a linear correlation. So really, the virus, the spread of the virus is essentially driven by um, travel from Wuhan, Un completely expected, but just pointing out that. Um, China also did uh, additional things, right? They had a level one emergency response, but they also shut down public transport by bus, subway, and rail inside cities, shut down schools and entertainment values, they banned public gatherings, they carried health checks on migrants, um, and they blocked travel between cities. So this is more draconian than what we did. Um, and by doing that, they, they can, this group then modeled what would have happened if they did this, if they didn't do this, um, um, and with the uh, travel shutdown, uh, sorry, w with the complete travel shutdown and with these level one responses and, uh, and everything in between. And you can essentially see that um, uh, without shutdown and without the level one response, we would have seen a massive uh, massive size of the epidemic in China, um, uh, exponential growth, even by mid-February, um, as opposed to the impact of these interventions. Both the travel ban uh, had an impact, the level one response had an impact, and the combination uh, made a, had a major impact, um, allowing the uh, control of the virus. And in this follow-up study, they kind of looked at that correlation between uh, growth rate uh, of the epidemic in these different provinces outside Ube, uh before and after the travel ban. So on the top is before the travel ban broken off into uh, one week blocks and the far right is kind of that week right before the travel ban where cases essentially linearly correlate uh, with the mobility from Wuhan. And with the institution of the travel ban, that correlation just essentially goes away and now it's you know, up to the local uh, the local factors that drive the epidemic. Can, can I stop you one second, yeah. Andre? Um, Nettie asked, I think it's on two slides back, could you explain the blue line? The one without shutdown looks good still. So that, yeah, so the blue line is without the travel shutdown, but instituting that level one response. So essentially all those, uh, all those, um, is, uh, I'm trying to say, all those government-related uh, interventions that um, uh, were instituted within a city as opposed to between cities. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and the travel ban was really to the instituting 
limiting travel between cities. And so that combination uh, is what the black line is, but the blue line, you know, putting all those interventions into place also would have made a, a, a decent impact on its own. Make sense? Um, so then lastly, I'm just gonna present this last paper. Uh, this is a completely, uh, a complete modeling paper, um, but it, they, they did a good job of sort of looking at a number of different uh, interventions that we can uh, use. Uh, it was a, they built a deterministic model um, for the US and for New York. Uh, and here essentially is a um, graph. And in all of these graphs, there's four figures. On the left side is New York City, and on the right is the US. Uh, and on the top is hospitalizations, and on the bottom is deaths. So for the next couple of uh, slides, that, that's sort of the schematic. Um, and then they looked at these differences in social distancing. So if you, how you impact the r not based on changes in social, uh, social interactions. And so by reducing social interactions uh, to, um, in, in this particular model, that they, if there was no change in social interactions, we'd see a peak sort of towards the end of May and then the epidemic would slowly die out, which is probably a little uh, hopeful. Um, but then they looked at the impact of these different interventions, uh, different levels of social distancing. And you can see that um, really with 40% decrease in social distancing, uh, you can make a huge impact on the number of hospitalizations. And in addition on the number of deaths. And so uh, again, this is gonna flatten out the A curve and that's what we did in the US and that's what really worked in California. We were able to get on top of it um, and so sort of fits there. Then they looked at masking. Um, and so here they looked at um, both the rate of people wearing masks and the efficacy of the masks. So the numbers at the top represent um, the efficacy of the mask. So that would be uh, how good a mask you're wearing. Is it a, a T cloth? Is it a uh, surgical mask? Is it an N95? Um, and they uh, then looked at the proportion, each of those lines represents a different proportion of individuals wearing masks in, in public all the time. And the, the important thing to note here is that, excuse me one second, is that masking here, this model uses, really is looking at the inward impact of the mask. So it's actually not protecting others, but protecting you. So this is, this is how um, a mask that you wear uh, to protect yourself would impact the epidemic. And as you might expect, again, so uh, with a, uh, a, a good efficacious mask, so 50% efficacy, which is essentially what a surgical mask is um, uh, in terms of particulates, uh, would, um, um, how, what, if that's the level it would work if, if you know, 30 to, or sorry, 50 to 75% of the population was wearing a surgical mask all the time, you're gonna have a significant impact on both hospitalizations and deaths. Um, the 75% is probably a little um, much of a reach because that's probably getting, starting to get closer to, uh, you know, an N95 um, worn properly all the time. So these, so then, you know, we've been telling everyone, wear your masks to protect your, protect the elders, protect, you know, protect others around you. Um, but there, there is more and more evidence, I think, and, and old evidence that I didn't realize before that masks actually work to protect you in public as well. Um, and so there's a real um, benefit, personal benefit to also wearing a mask as well as to the outside individuals. And so this is an old study from 2007 uh, where um, they looked at the, uh, they looked at particles um, coming in through a mask inward uh, as well as going outward. And, and it turns out that the tea cloth, and I'm not sure, you know, a tea cloth is probably a little thinner than what most of the cloth masks we're using these days are, uh, but 90% of the particles still went out after a cough into the environment. So that it's a little different probably than a breath or a, a sneeze, or you're gonna carry, catch most of the droplets, but for a cough, um, you know, it wasn't doing a great job. Um, but it was protecting, you know, 66% of the particles coming in through the mask. Um, 
And similarly for a surgical mask, it was 75% for an N95, it was, uh, you know, one as expected, right? It should be roughly around five for N95. Um, and then similarly, the decrease uh, went up with surgical mask and, and um, 95. And then when they kind of went back, there's some other studies looking at the SARS epidemic. And um, in 2003, they, they did a sort of a case control study for people who acquired SARS just kind of out in, in public places or uh, in, in locations where there was uh, an infected person um, that was known to have spread the virus. Uh, uh, and people that were wearing a mask uh, had a 70% uh, reduced likelihood of acquiring SARS. Now, granted, someone that was wearing a mask is probably going to be taking additional precautions and things. Um, so it's not uh, a complete, uh, it's unlikely to be fully an impact of the mask, uh, but there definitely was a signal there. Um, and then similarly, uh, uh, when they looked at uh, different viruses and um, surgical masks, uh, for exhalation, uh, so this is a recent study by Lung et al. where they looked at sort of how well uh, masks uh, protect or the release of expired particles um, when you're just exhaling, not coughing, not sneezing, but exhaling. Um, and for coronavirus, it did a great job. Um, so surgical masks blocked all the droplets, uh, uh, both bigger than five micrometers and less than five micrometers. It wasn't SO2 for other viruses. Um, but again, this was a very, fairly small sample size, and this was just exhalation as opposed to uh, a forceful cough or a forceful sneeze. So masks work, definitely, if you wear them, both to protect you and the public. And I think that if we make that clear a little bit more, that they protect you as well, um, we may get a greater uptake of, of mask use in the public, because I still see tons and tons of people uh, just wandering around without masks. Um, so that's really all I have to say. The only the last piece, this is just slide that we just is very preliminary. We just kind of put this together really recently. Um, so all the other work was other people's work. This is stuff that we're we're working on. So there are other factors that may impact the epidemic moving forward in the next surge. And so one, one thing we looked at um, with my student uh, uh, who did this um, is that we looked at how um, by county which counties had um, good numbers of hospital beds for uh, patients or people over the age of 65. So the top figure represents, it's basically hospital beds per 1,000 persons over the age of 65. So uh, is there sort of hospital bed capacity for older individuals we know are hospitalized at a much higher rate than, than other individuals? And then we looked at that and put that in, um, and then we looked at the uh, reported case fatality rate by county across the U.S. Uh, to to this point, um, and that's plotted on the second figure. And you know, I didn't we didn't I didn't put the actual correlation analysis in here. But if you look carefully, you can kind of see these spots where there's lighter colors up top. If you can see my arrow, so example for Arizona, where there's a, a fewer hospital beds for um, eight people over the age of 65, you can see the mortality rate goes way up. Similarly here, it's higher. Similarly in um, uh, West Florida, there's a pocket of high mortality. Louisiana, there's a pocket of high mortality. Uh, up here in the uh, Connecticut area, there's a pocket of high mortality. So, uh, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, we haven't done the numeric analysis yet, but uh, it, it, and there's, here's another sort of pocket of um, here in, I think that's Oklahoma, Arkansas area. Um, so there does seem to be a relationship between bed capacity uh, uh, and, and the case fatality rate. And, and the reason I was thinking about this is, uh, you know, I have an uncle that's a geriatrician in New Jersey, and, and he's in a rural part of New Jersey. And as he was telling me, he's like, you know, my patients, I, they get sent to the hospital and they get made DNR no matter what anyone says. And there are people dying left and right. No one's even making an effort. Uh, to treat the COVID patients in, in, in rural settings. And, you know, I don't know if that may just be unique to his county, but I, I doubt it. And, and I wonder if sort of hospital capacity and, and things are actually playing a role in sort of how we manage our patients as well. So with that, I'll, I'll stop um, and take questions, I think. Wow, Sanjay, thank you so much. That was, um, your last comment, comments, very sobering. and.
<clears throat> I think reflects a little bit in what we heard in ID rounds yesterday. It's at the nine o'clock hour. Obviously, some people have clinic and need to go to things, but I think we can stand for a few minutes if, if people have questions. Nothing came up uh, explicitly or specifically in the chat box, but I will open up the floor if people want to unmute and ask a question. This is Francesca. This is a fantastic presentation, really very interesting. I, I'm wondering if, and this may not be available publicly, but if you could uh, overlay uh, skilled nursing facilities in certain oh, areas. Yeah. <laughs> and, and see if that uh, also lights up in terms of mortality. That's a good idea. Yeah, we can definitely try to do that. We're going to try to do ICU beds as well. Um, let me look at that as well. Um, yep. And I don't know if you can see the chat. <clears throat> Nettie said, I'd like to see that hospital bed map data when you finish the correlation. Very interesting for policy. I think we all agree on that. Sure. If not open the chat. Oh, there it is, the chat box. It, it's mostly just great job, you rock, you're the best. Um, but certainly people um, you know, should absolutely ask questions. We can't see each other and we're not in the same room, but this is the time. Imagine, I'm picturing you raising your hand and me and Marvin running around handing you microphones. All right. Just virtually. <laughs> I think you're mostly just getting big compliments on the great talk. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for letting me talk this morning. And uh, if you have any questions, you can obviously just email me too. That'll work. Thanks so much, Sanjay. Right. Uh, we really, really appreciate you giving this fantastic talk.